Please. There we go. So John Cuthbertson and uh, at the back there we've got Arthur Lee, who's Vice Chair, who you'll meet in the field this afternoon, and together we'll be helping you understanding how to use the tramper and go around through the gates. And we've also got um, other members of the Desailed Ramblers, so yeah, just have a chat and find out more about us. But uh, we'll try and introduce them to you a bit by saying who we are and what we're all about. And Facebook for the young people. <laughs> Access needs for everybody, not just for the disabled. Information needs to look at view range out. So that's us. Barriers. What I'd like you just to think about, because there's no questions, I can't ask you to answer this, but what do you think in your mind are the main what is the main barrier to us accessing the countryside? Just think what do you think? You know, you'll be thinking about styles and steps and all sorts of kissing gates and other barriers. What I've found going round is that the main barrier is people's perceptions. People and everyone here wants to make their bit of the countryside accessible. But there's so many that don't really understand just how difficult it is or how easy it is in some cases. And so when the question is asked, can I go there? We get the ranger said, I couldn't possibly get through over that bridge. Now, when someone says you can't do it, to some of our members, that's a red rag to the bull, and they'll go out and do it anyway. And there she is. Plenty of clearance, no problem. She's across the bridge. But then she comes across a locked gate. So the ranger said, well, if you tell us, give us a couple of days' notice, give us a phone call, we'll make sure the barrier's open to you. But it doesn't work like that for the disabled. Am I going to be well enough on the day? There are a lot of conditions out there that mean that you can only go out when conditions are right for your health. You know, the, the, the rest of the population don't have to phone up and ask if they can please maybe go out today. So it's, it's a, just a thinking, how can we overcome this sort of problem? So, the disabled rambles are just ordinary people. Most of them have enjoyed a great life in the outdoors and want to continue it. And we can see some of our members there. This is uh, my wife here, who's in the audience. Uh, before she came blind, she loved going around on her scooter. It's a bit more difficult now, because I have to steer it and you know, get the acceleration as well. So a bit of a challenge. We've got, say blindness, but we've got amputations. We've got a lady with no legs and only the stubs of her fingers. But just because she's got that crook there and nothing else above, can you still operate a tramper? And she loves being in the outdoor swings. All the other stuff, heart attacks and strokes and arthritis and motor neurone disease, who had a member who's reckoned he kept him going for another five years by being able to get out with us. Got oh, four or five members with polio and MS and just old age. It's going to happen to all of you folks, you know, think about investing in your own future. <laughs> Facebook's a bit new to us and I'm just amazed at how um, popular it's become. We've got uh, about 300 members and they're active, they're in involved and they want to know so many things. A lot of them want to go rambling on their own. That means on their own, not with someone else who's going to open the gates for them, but on their own. They're very keen to get out and enjoy the freedom that the rest of us can enjoy. We also get lots of technical questions, and that's great. We love answering, what's the best scooter? How do I repair this? I keep getting pictures. What can I do about it? Lots of access questions. That's the sad bit, though. And there's a, a thread going on at the moment where um, Liverpool, Manchester Canal is putting in barriers. That's really nice of them, isn't it? So, we, uh, you know, we, we're making it harder as well as making it easier. We'll take out the style and then we'll put up a, a barrier. And we ramble for the same reason, for enjoyment, for social life. 
So, say people want to go out on their own, but there's a lot want to go out in a group, lots of social interaction. And, you know, people are members of the Ramblers, find the same thing. And a lot of our members are ex Rambler members themselves. Mental stimulation, we know all about the good work that that's, you know, that's going to do for us. But it's also physical. You wouldn't think it's sitting on a scooter. You try it for a day, and it's actually tiring. I end up shattered. I go out on, I've got a tramper, and I go out checking routes out, trying to find where the barriers are and get them removed. And at the end of an eight-mile journey, I am quite shattered. It's the physical uh, upper body work out that you get. So it's good for them, good for everyone. It's a challenge. For some, it's a challenge to get out the front door. For others, the challenge is to get to the top of a mountain. And, you know, both things are possible with uh, the right equipment. And all this gives us a great sense of achievement. They feel, I've done it, I've got there, I've achieved, and you know, I'm part of the outdoor environment again. We go all over England and Wales, and a bit of Scotland, We'd like to go further, but you know, there's a limited number of us. I should say, those of us who organise things, we're all volunteers, none of us are paid. This is a charity with no real income. So if there's any go people got big donations you want to make. <laughs> we go out, as I say, I go out and others go out, they check out routes, they plan them, they categorise them, risk assess them, written risk assessment. We're insured, all that good stuff. And we run it. 30 plus rambles a year, which doesn't sound many, but there's only a few of us, and uh, we'd like more, as I was just saying to Rachel, wherever she is at the moment. Thanks, Rachel. So Rachel's going to organise some in the Yorkshire Dales. It'd be great to get back up there again. We've had some great rambles in the Yorkshire Dales, but we haven't been there for years because the person who organised those rambles uh, doesn't do it anymore. We can only go where people will organise rambles for us. And here are Rachel Wolf here. Mastars Lane, an old drove road up in the Yorkshire Dales. Really wonderful, rocky descent there. But we can also go up it. The walkers needed a rest, not the scooters. <laughs> an old slate quarry road in uh, North Wales. Going through floods, go through um, fords. Brings out the kid in us again. Love doing that. So, what is it we need? <clears throat> Always think least restrictive access. That's your mantra. What's the least I need to do? And when you think of if <coughs> British Standard BS5709 tells you what sort of gap you should have, uh, whether it's a gap or a gate or whatever, and it tells you that width, but it means all the way up to the sky, it doesn't mean the first foot. It's not just the wheels that have to go through, the rest of the machine and person, people with bumps and everything else, has to get through. So, you know, we talked about these K frames, these H frames, whatever motorbike inhibitors that can narrow up. It's, they'll never be in the British standard, they just won't conform. They need to be able to be open to a person on their own without leaving the scooter. <coughs> and please tie them back. It's part of the British standard. You put in a gate and it conforms to the British standard, but unless you maintain it, it doesn't. And part of that maintenance is, if it isn't needed for a reasonable length of time for stop control or whatever, then it must be tied back. What's often not thought about is tying back kissing gates. I don't mean your ordinary little ones that are no good to us anyway. I mean the radar kissing gate, which we'll come on to. So you can unlock it, tie it back, makes it easy for everyone. How far have we come? Well, so 21 years ago, well, in fact, 23 years ago, the um, 10th pack was open to great fanfare. We've made it accessible, we've removed the styles, we've put in kissing gates. Great, except that the kissing gates are too small. So, Robin Helby there, uh, oh, <laughs> Robin Helby there, I thought that was a pointer, in the middle, um, very innovative. He came up with this solution a bridge. So there they are, unpacking this bridge, which was towed behind a scooter. This is pre tramper days as well. So over a course of five days, they covered 62 miles, and at each barrier, they had to assemble this bridge and go up and over 
the kissing game. That's how determined disabled people can be. And Robin actually rode his scooter up and over as well. <laughs> that sort of guy. And that's the pre precursor of the tramper. You see the tramper's big wheels at the back there. On an ordinary scooter. So a bit about the tramper. It was developed for the disabled rammers. The original members got together and um, put in uh, a, a request for, to a company and they made the tramper for them. It's big. But it's legal, so it's a category three, a class three scooter. So it's legal to use on the roads, on footpaths, around Tesco's, anywhere you like. So it's legal wherever a pedestrian can go, wherever a person can go. It's heavy, but it's legally heavy. But you can't lift it up and over a stile. It's made in England, that's great. And there are, is the possibility of trial loans. If you, as an organisation, want to try one out before you buy, we have got one or two that we can lend out. We lent one to Cody Brennan, and they, after evaluating it and finding four good ramble routes, they uh, gave it back to us and they've got their own. So we can do that for others. And we've lent one to the centre here uh, on long loan, and you'll be using it today. You, I don't know if you heard that. Ooh, wow, well done. But to me, that epitomises the lack of understanding of what things can do. You know, he was totally surprised that the scooter would get down there safely. It also got up there safely, it, but it's um, on these sharp, these edges. It doesn't get much traction, so it didn't need a bit of a push. But they've, they've changed it now. They put a ramp in there. We were asked to go out and evaluate this route by the council, and uh, that's what we we did. Yeah, why they didn't sort it out to begin with, it's hard to understand, but now it's sorted now. But not for that stuff, Steph. That's a, a deterrent even for able-bodied people. There's no handrails. How do you get anything up and over that? Three plank bridges, your typical three plank bridge, just isn't wide enough. Brand new bridge. So uh, a local member budget is cancelled and they put in another plank, four planks now. So think about it, do it at the beginning rather than afterwards. We came across, Liz and I came across this lovely bridge, great in its day, I'm sure. However, you can see it's got uh, a barrier at the start and at the end and it's a bit wonky. So we phoned up the council and said, no problem, we'll condemn it. Immediately they put some red tape across it, it was condemned. Amazingly, it only took six weeks to get a new bridge in, lovely new bridge. <laughs> totally useless, totally useless. And so you've got your ordinary gates, your kissing gates that are replacing styles. Great, thanks very much for replacing styles, that's a step forward, but it isn't. Because that's going to be there, I expect, for 25 years, because it's been well made and solid. And it means that that was a barrier there for 25 years. If you're going to put kissing gates in, and I really don't like them, if you're going to put kissing gates in, then think about putting in a radar kissing gate. You know the radar padlock? It's the, the radar key that's used by the stable for their toilets. The same thing is done here. You buy an, there's an individual padlock that comes as a self-contained padlock, and it slots in and it's bolted into the gate. And when the um, the hasp is withdrawn, then it opens the other way. Otherwise, it acts as a normal kissing gate. So, if people, walkers approaching it see a normal kissing gate, walkers um, disabled take out the key and open it up. However, it needs thinking about where you sight it. And if you sight it on the edge of the River Severn, that's a bit of a worry. So, they put in a, a bit of a barrier for us, sort of. And again, it's lack of understanding. The farmer didn't know it opened the other way, so he just put his water pipe down into the river and blocked it. But told him about it, fine, buried it. But you know, that was a heck of a hassle when we came across it because 
Fortunately, I was able to drag it out of the way and then get the trampler up and over the gate once it was over the pipe once the gate was open. So, and that was on a record finding out the way through. This is uh, an exercise in patience. So I hope you've got patience. This is not done for the camera. So imagine there are 14 of these gates on this particular route from right by where we live into Worcester around, uh, around the River Severn. Lovely route and it's great that the council have done it but imagine doing this on your own 14 times. Just getting the balance right. Oh no. Now, just an example of how difficult it can be on your own. And then, of course, the person's got to turn around, go back, and lock the gate. In Cornwall, this chap on the scooter here, he hates these, uh, the ones I've just shown you, with a vengeance, and he won't, won't allow them to go into Cornwall. So he's persuaded the authorities down there to come up with this other solution. And you see him using a stick and with that stick, he can lift the um, two-way latch on a two-way self-closing gate, and there's a pair of them. So he's used his stick to lift the latch in this example, and he goes through into the airlock, and then because he's able, and not everyone is, because he's able, he's lifting, he's pulling the trombone handle to get through the second one. So a combination of trombone and uh, two-way latch and two-way self-closing gate is probably as good as it gets as far as accessible barriers if you can't just have a go and of course that sort of arrangement I believe is used on bridle paths quite a lot but there it's used on a footpath um, but bridle paths sometimes have these abominations on them boar style to conform to the British standard and to allow access for the disabled, they need a bypass route, which we can see to the side here. So it's got to have a way of getting pedestrians past it to be any use to us. So horse style isn't liked by the horse riding community either. But there we are. They're put in. But this had got a bypass route. You see the old horse style on the left. And the gate on the, the right here has got a chain around it. So we can get, I couldn't get through. I'd, I'd already done seven miles and had to go back another seven miles because I was expecting to get into this car park here. And there's a scooter the other side. On here we'll see a radlock, a radar padlock, which can be fitted to uh, gates in manufacture or to wooden gates after manufacture. And that uses the radar key to open it. So if you've got something that can't be piped got through, on a scooter, like a, a, a horse style or a, uh, an A-frame, then a bypass gate with a padlock on will do the job. And then here we are with our motorcycle inhibitors. Now this one wasn't wide enough to get a motorcycle scooter through. And just that reminds me, we're talking about trampers when you're doing the measurements, but they're, it's, it's narrower than the legal maximum and there are bigger scooters. So when these were originally designed, the gates and so on, uh, the, the chap that designed them, Tom Bindoff, who you'll meet this afternoon, designed them around the trampler, because that's all there was at the time. But there are bigger scooters now, so think about that. Anyway, this, this one wasn't accessible. The local chap that wanted to get through complained, and they opened it up, widened it the gap, and you can get a scooter through. I'm standing on a roadway, a little bit of a road, and I turn around and I'm in an adjoining county where they refuse point blank to open the gap. They're using a fern barrier, a different sort, and 
they're determined that they won't allow motorbikes through, but we all know that motorbikes will get through wherever they want, if they want to. So yeah, I could wiggle the handlebars in this case, <coughs> and then the seat gets stuck. So without getting, literally taking the seat up, I wouldn't be able to get, I wasn't able to get through. It took me ages to untangle myself from that. And you see that these things here are trying to uh, stop handlebars being wiggled through. So they, they do what they can, but in the end, all they do is bar the disabled. There is a solution, an opening motorcycle inhibitor, radar padlock, and then you can drive a vehicle through. Quick aside from barriers in that way, this is a barrier in its own right. If you've got chicken wire still on any of your services, please remove it. It breaks up and gets in dog's feet. Horrible. It's a trip hazard. Horrible. But it's also a heck of a safety hazard. If you get a puncture, which the chap that took this photograph did, if you get a puncture on a scooter and you can't get off and repair it, you've got to call up for help. You can't wheel it home like you can with a bicycle. Uh, coming back to the two-way latch, that's it in, um, in close-up, and here's how I went about opening it. This is using a standard walking pole, get it underneath the latch, and then there's a clang as it shuts behind it. Great, job done. Come on now, that's a bit about barriers. Now come on to information. How do we get information out there? There's so many different routes that people get confused and hopefully amongst all the different ways they'll find something. What we use is um, View Ranger. So people are going to be asking all sorts of questions. They want to know where the barrier free routes are, where toilets are, where parking is. Can they take the dogs? Can they take the children? You know, is there something of interest? So we use view ranger. So when I go out and colleagues go out, they record the route and then they'll uh, put it up onto the web for others to download. And I, there's about 500, over 500 routes for the disabled on there at the moment. I've put about 200 of them up. So people can go onto view ranger and download the route so they then follow it on there. GPS device, their, their iPhone, whatever phone, and it's even you can even set it so that if you go off route by a certain amount, you know, five yards, 10, 20 yards, it will beep at you and tell you you've gone off route. It's this is I don't know if you can read any of that. This is stuff that you can put in, so the person creating the route can say no dogs except registered assistance dogs, for example. Wheelchair friendly, large off road mobility scooters, and so on. Uh, and that was the route around Chap Clapworthy Reservoir. Beautiful route, apart from them not allowing ordinary dogs. Beautiful route, um, and you can put in uh, the icons to say there's a hazard here. There was a lovely Ford. Um, well, I say lovely because I enjoyed going through Fords. But because we fed that back to them, they made it even better and easier for everyone to use. And then the description down on the left hand side. Tells you the altitude gain and everything else. So that's a way of getting information out. South Downs use it, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, another way of doing it is uh, on, on um, Google Maps and accessible Malvins. Malvin Ridge, uh, near to Worcester, if you've got the A5, M5, you'll see the line of the Malvins stretching away near to where we live. And the, the local uh, businessman said, We need a a cable car up the Mulvins because the disabled have the right to be at the top of the Mulvins Hills. So, right, okay, we'll show them. We got to the top of the hills, we got on the press and everything else. You don't need a cable car. It never happened, thank goodness. But as a result, there are two trampers now at the bottom of that um, uh, pass, the uh, witch um, cafe down there. You can hire a couple of trampers and come up and have a look at the <coughs> But how far can you get down there? I've been out and mapped over 70 kilometers of accessible route. It's one of the best compact areas for people using mobility scooters to go. 
Uh, there's a lot more information on the web. It, it, I've just removed it to show you some of the lines, but you can put where the parking spots are, or I have put where the parking spots are, and so on. Uh, cafes and uh, other points of interest and hazards. And amazingly, we've already had 3,000 views. It's only been up there a month. So that shows you the power of the, the internet. There's a lot of people out there. Whether anyone's ever used it, um, you know, actually used the information, no idea. But at least people are interested. Now really, the, you've got a great opportunity this afternoon to get out there and try a scooter. Get on there, please. We had this training course at Crickley uh, and um, Crickley whatever. Crickley Hill. Crickley Hill. And they've got a tramper there and Arthur brought his and I brought ours. And we had a hell of a job getting them on the trampers. We couldn't then get them off. And so it's the only way to learn is to get out and try it. So in summary, let the disabled decide if the route is suitable. Don't put them off, so, but make sure that they're safe. We're not looking for tarmac everywhere, but we are wanting barriers removed. Remove barriers and let us get on with it. So think about this, not stopping legitimate use because of illegal use, because that's illegal too. Please talk about pissing gates and others. And always have this thought in your mind, is this the least restrictive access? We've only just had the tramper at this point. This is, uh, what, six years ago or no longer? Ten, ten, ten years ago. And uh, so Liz has been rather careful on it. But it gives you an idea of the articulation and what is possible on the tramper. And also, what's possible with a bit of persuasion, because that was the rocking path, and that's as far as it would really go. Um, but they've now improved the path for another half mile, and we can get up to the Gladstone Rock. So it can be done with a bit of will. So thank you, everybody. And I'd normally say any questions, but I'd love to take questions. You can ask me two minutes of questions. Excellent. What's the range of the tramway? It all depends. Yeah. On the flat, in the uh, you know, tarmac, then you might get 30 miles, 20 miles. We, we reckon on 12. And our rambles are <coughs> limited to about 8. Of course, the walkers don't want to go any further than that. <laughs> but it just depends on the terrain. I mean, our walkers are of a similar age, generally. <coughs> so, yeah, uh, our rambles are 5 to 8 miles, but the trample will do perhaps twice as much. But it depends on the terrain. I'm quite interested in what you said earlier about you have almost available for people to actually try and yeah. uh, lend out. So maybe I'll catch up with you later. I'm quite interested in, in having a go with that because uh, I'm from Dartmoor. It's quite, quite roughish places. Yeah. Think, but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, look at that picture. Obviously, it stopped there, I guess, but we, we've got opportunity to do lots of improvements at the moment. So yeah. Rattlebrook Tramway is a great route. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we actually had our picnic above the, the gate. I, I had to lift the front. The, lift, the front's quite light, but the back's very heavy. So I lifted it over where it bogged down and got stuck in between the stones, but we did get it past that gate. Anyone else? How many members do you have in total? Only 200, membership? plus okay. 300 on Facebook. Oh, and, yeah. and do most of your members invest in their own trampers? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah, well we've got, God, we've got about 12 now. It's, <laughs> people leave them to us, which is wonderful, which really? is why we've got yes. some spare ones. Uh, but we, we take four around with us uh, in a, a big trailer, and that trailer becomes an accessible toilet, and uh, so we've got four that we loan out on our rambles to people without their own. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Any last question? Uh, yeah, just one. So if an organisation, a countryside service or a national park was going to um, invest in some trampers, what is the best kind of vehicle um, to, say, move to around from site to site? To move them around? Yes, you need to, to take them somewhere for people to hire. I would have thought, uh, I mean, I, you can get your own proper tramper trailer, for one. Yeah. Um, but I, I've seen just a, an open back trailer that most national parks would have, 
and they can get three or four on it. Uh, perhaps people, anyone here with experience of bigger? We've had them on just <coughs> with that trailer, or with a Land Rover trailer. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.